You may have seen YouTube videos titled, Make Clay from Dirt, or some such nonsense. Which is kind of like saying, make wood from trees. What they're really trying to show you is how to find clay, and then process it. Which is what I'm going to show you now. Recently, I found some clay outside of Madrid, Spain. I grabbed a few samples and brought you along with me to see how I go about finding wild clay in new places. And now I want to show you how I process the clay that I find, which entails removing large impurities and then mixing the clay to a workable consistency. Much like finding wild clay, processing it is much easier than you might imagine. Next week I'll show you how I test these samples of clay by making bars for measuring shrinkage and porosity, as well as throwing a sample to gauge how plastic it is. These tests will tell me more about how I can make pottery with this particular clay, and then how hot it should be fired. Today, I'll show you three different ways of working with wild clay samples. Unprocessed clay, dry processed clay, and wet processed clay. Each method has advantages and disadvantages, which I'll discuss in turn. First, this clay has the right amount of water in it to work with it right now. So I'll show you what happens when you work with a wild clay with no processing, straight out of the ground onto the wheel. I just have to mix this up and then wedge it to make it homogenous. The better mixed a clay is, the better it will work for you. This particular clay is, well, it's mostly dirt. Really, I probably shouldn't call it clay at all. It's soil with just enough clay to hold it together. And it's damn near worthless for pottery. I took a sample because out in the field it passed my coil test, indicating that it is plastic. However, even out in the field, it felt super weird and gloopy, and I didn't really expect it to work. And in reality, it's awful. So I want to try to figure out how a sample could pass a plasticity test out in the wild, but be so non-plastic in reality. If I learn anything useful here, I'll share it over on my Instagram. Some clays are better than others, but this kind of thing can happen with any wild clay. You just can't know what is in a clay if you don't filter it at all. And in this sample, I found some large twigs. This makes throwing difficult, and not only that, but chances are that this would explode in a kiln, because that twig won't give up all of its water, which will turn into steam and build up pressure and then explode in the kiln. I have successfully thrown pieces from unprocessed clay, with fairly large rocks in them even. Many of the raku pieces in earlier videos were made from unprocessed clay. Some of them even had really large stones. But that was all part of the aesthetic for those raku pieces. I really recommend processing your clay with one of the following methods, and if you find that your filter doesn't collect much in the way of twigs and rocks, you can try using that same clay unprocessed. Here, I'm processing that same sample of clay using the wet method. I already know it's a terrible sample of clay, but let's see if it improves at all with processing. Hint, it doesn't. So I'll add a bunch of water, mix it into a runny slip, and then pour it through a sieve to catch any of those twigs or rocks that might be in it. The finer the mesh you use for a sieve, the more stuff you'll remove. Then I pour the slip into a bisque-fired bowl. It's made thick, and because it is porous, it will absorb the water from the slip and leave behind a workable clay. Or it would if this stuff weren't so awful to use. Again, I think it's largely organic matter, that's decomposed plants and animals, which is not clay and can never be made into clay. The wet method is a good method when you have the time and space. The more clay you process this way, the more time it takes to dry, and the bigger the drying vessel you need. Check out a previous video for some advice on how to dry larger amounts of clay. This bisque bowl technique is good enough for little samples, and it's easy to throw these bowls out of a cheap terracotta clay. You can see that the bowl gets dark as it absorbs the water from the slip. The benefits of the wet method are that it takes less active time. You just mix everything with water, pour it through the sieve, and it's all pretty quick. Plus, it hydrates every clay particle, so that when it dries out to the right consistency, you've got a clay that is as plastic as it can be without aging it. It's really as good as using a commercial pug mill 
for hydrating the clay and then leaving behind a clay that has no air bubbles. What I'm doing now is the dry method. If you don't have a good setup, this can be laborious and slow and less effective, in my opinion. But I do it when I just want to process a pound or so so that I can make test bars, which I'll show you in the next video in this series, and when I want to just throw a little sample cup. It's quick because I can just add the amount of water I need to make the clay workable and then use it right away, rather than waiting hours or even days for a slip to dry. But it does take some time to break up the clay and then sift it. If you have a mortar and pestle, it goes faster or any other kind of tools that will help you crush it up. But I don't have anything like that right now, so it's just my hands. You should absolutely wear a respirator when doing this. Dry clay is bad for your lungs, especially when you have repeated prolonged exposure. In other words, if you're a potter. I'm not wearing one because I'm dumb and you should not mimic me. Most clay requires something in the neighborhood of 20% water by weight. So this sample is 275 grams of dry clay. So I'll add about 55 grams of water. I'll start there and add a little bit more if necessary. This clay is a little bit better than the other sample. It's not good by any means, but it is possible to make a little cup out of it. So tune in next week to see how these clays work on the wheel and to see how and why I make little test bars for each sample. I'll also talk more about how I evaluate a clay's usefulness for pottery. Even a clay that doesn't work well on the wheel can be useful in glazes or as slips. Future videos in this series will continue this process of finding, processing, using, and testing wild clays, including all of the various tests and experiments that I do. I hope that you'll find it useful, and I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.